Welcome to the Homesteading for Beginners podcast. This is Mona Weathers, your host. Today, I'm really excited to bring another great interview to you. Um, We'll be talking with Laura Cox from Cox Homestead, um, and we'll be talking about raising rabbits for the homestead. And we will also be talking about butchering rabbits. So if you're sensitive to that topic, um, I think it's going to be more in the second part of this interview series. I will be breaking up this interview series into two parts. Longer interviews are broken up into two parts. So the next episode will be part two. But if you're interested in the future, I'll have all of these um, interviews, (laughs) hopefully on YouTube. Right now I have the episode with Melissa K. Norris, the video episode with Melissa K. Norris on YouTube. So if you want to check that out, you can go to my YouTube channel. I'll have the link in the show notes, but I hope you enjoy this. It was very educational for me since I've never raised rabbits for meat. Listen to this. This is part of the small scale homestead series um, that I will end up putting in some sort of email uh, resource, something so that you can just go to all the small scale homestead um, episodes and I'm going to make that easy for you. Also, don't forget the June promo for the workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers will end at the end of June. So you only have like, I don't know, is that a week and a half left? So um, just make sure that you take advantage of that. The promo code is in the show notes as well, and you'll get 20% 20 off, more than 20% off. So check that out. I also have, if you're just now hearing this for the first time, listen to the end of this podcast episode, and you'll hear me talk about that as well. Okay, here's the interview with Laura Cox about raising rabbits on the homestead. All right, today I have a guest, uh, Laura Cox, and we I brought her on the podcast because I want to talk about rabbits mainly, but I want to, uh, I, she's got a lot going on and we're going to learn about her. We met on Instagram, the good old Instagram. I either met people on Instagram or Clubhouse. It seems like those are those are the two places I've met people and have, have had them on the show. But I'm really excited to talk about this conversation. This is continuing on with our small scale uh, homestead uh, topic series. And rabbits are a perfect w- animal, a livestock to start for small scale. You can pretty much put them anywhere and Laura will share that with us. So Laura, thank you for being here. And I'm just glad that you are here. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) So uh, let's get started by introducing you to my audience, my um, listeners. Um, Where, where, like, give us some background and like, how long have you been homesteading and that sort of thing? Sure. So I am originally from Southern Indiana. I Moved away at 19 to Tennessee, and I have been here ever since. My husband and I have been homesteading since we got married in 2011. And I grew up gardening, but I always wanted to be on a farm. We didn't have any animals besides cats and dogs and your typical pets. Um, But I knew that that was the life I wanted to chase. And so we started out living on the campus while my husband finished his degree. We had a trailer on campus that we put a couple rice beds in and we landscaped and I was making homemade bread and Um, all these meals from scratch and just learning a lot about where my food came from. So I would say at heart, I have been a homesteader from the beginning. In fact, one of the first gifts that my husband ever gave me was uh, this book called Backyard Market Gardening. And I didn't, I didn't make it all the way through the book, but I made it far enough to see that the most important ingredient to gardening and what I would say this homestead life is the soil. What's your starting your roots out in? And so that's kind of the mindset I had going into this life. And what is, what is my roots? What is the soil? What is my foundation and purpose for living this life? And so I I fell in love with the idea of nourishing my family through food and time together and having a purpose. And so We dove into it. We had a half acre in Knoxville for six years. And I would say we maxed out. We had at that half acre, we had a huge garden, um, chickens and rabbits. 
and we were fruit trees and bushes and everything. And we were reaching the point of, we want more. And so we didn't have a lot of money to get a lot more, <laughs> mm-hmm. but we had enough um, saved up from our previous house when we sold that to get five acres. And so now we have five acres, a house, a short-term rental, huge gardens, a nice barn, and three acres now fenced in which and we have uh, rabbits and chickens still as well awesome i love the barn part that's something i really wanted when we were looking for property here in georgia i'm like i don't really care about the house as much if i have a really nice barn we didn't get a nice we didn't get a nice barn or any barn actually we just got a nice house (laughs) which is fine too but i was like i could live in a barn Yeah, I will say our barn is living on a prayer. Um, mm-hmm. Like all four corner posts are rotted out, and it just it just sits there. So yeah, that's <laughs> funny. We have a barn, and it is nice ish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's at least you can take pictures in front of it and oh, <laughs> that yeah, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, it's Instagram worthy. I'll say that. Yeah, <laughs> and it houses our animals, so it is sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So what? got you started uh with rabbits like why did you choose that as an animal to raise and what do you raise them for yeah so we when we were living on a half acre we really didn't have plans of moving um when we were there we were like okay what can we do on a small scale we were we were pretty content on a half acre and so my husband kept mentioning rabbits and my response was no like i had pet rabbits as a kid we are not going to get rabbits to eat for meat it's not going to happen. And so about two years of him talking about it finally brought me around to the idea because I would see it pop up in, in books and podcasts and YouTube videos about how sustainable rabbit meat was. And I was like, oh, OK, fine. You can do it. Get the cage. Get the rabbits. I want nothing to do with it. This will be your thing. And so he did. He went and got the cage all by himself. And then when it came time to go get the rabbits, I was like, can I go with you? (laughs) And so I did, I went with him and then he's like, well, you can pick them out since you're here, you know? And so (laughs) I picked them out and I was still on the fence of trying to figure out how I could uh, connect myself with them or keep me at a distance um, to guard myself from what was going to happen. And within six months of having these rabbits, I had fell in love with them and had taken over the whole operation Mm. (laughs) from gathering the poop to breeding um, to taking care of the kits. And I would say probably for the first two years, I did everything except for dispatch the rabbits. I was still uncomfortable with that. I didn't really want to associate with that. It, it made, it made me a little bit uncomfortable because I had never experienced processing my own animals before. And so after about two years of watching him do it and people asking, Uh, me to teach them how to do it. I was like, well, I can't teach you how to do it because I don't do it personally. Mm -hmm. That's when I was uh, convicted and felt the need. Okay, I've got to learn how to do this. And so I started getting my hands in there and learning how to process them as well. So I will say I didn't just dive into rabbits and say, I want to raise rabbits for me. This is my thing. It was my husband's thing that slowly became my thing. And I saw the beauty of it and saw the benefits of it and how honestly easy it is to do and how simple it is to raise meat for a family even on such a small scale and in such a small space okay that's awesome i like that that story of how it happened like you didn't just like i'm gonna raise rabbits you're like "Uh, that's kind of where i'm at i had um rabbits you know i had a rabbit when i was a teenager my little (laughs) dotty her name was dotty but i've never but I have this cute factor that it's hard for me to get over. And even with uh, when we process chickens or, or, or any of the poultry, my husband did that part of it, the killing part. And mm-hmm. I did the processing part because once it's not alive anymore, it's not, <laughs> you know, it was easy and I can, I, it gets very clinical for me at that point. So, um, but my husband also doesn't like to, you know, he ha- he struggles with the cuteness factor as well. So it's yeah. good to hear that you came from that, uh, you know, that space as well and that you just grew into it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So I had the opportunity the past two days to talk with every fourth grader in my county. Mm-hmm. And I got to teach them what I call the five F's of rabbit. And that's basically the five reasons we have 
rabbits in America today. Mm -hmm. And what was so fascinating to see these kids' eyes light up when I told them the reason why we have domesticated rabbits in America today is for food. They came mm. over on the ships with the early explorers as a quick protein source when they got here. So they didn't mm. have to spend their time hunting for meat. They had it readily available. Mm. And so when I think about that and think about why we even have them here, it helps me to step back into perspective and have that appreciation that they do have another purpose besides being cute. Right. And so it, it, it almost like draws me into my, the roots of humanity of, mm -hmm. you know, what we're here to do mm -hmm. and provide and, and takes that personality that we want to put on animals or that humanness <laughs> we want to put on animals out and says, no, these animals are here to serve us right. and we are to respect them in return. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, culturally our culture just now at least in the history they did but we don't do we don't eat rabbit regularly so that so we have they became pets and so it's mm -hmm. hard but you know like cultures around the world are doing you know ha are doing this and other things that we don't see as you know a good option so it's just it's just how we we're raised even just ta taste uh, palate you know, uh, different p cultures eat goat and a lot of people here in the States don't like goat because of the taste or, go you know, whatever it is, but it can be learned. Like you're saying, it can be learned and we can appreciate both the, the part that it was, it's designed to help us, but also we can appreciate their life sacrifice for us, you know, that, yeah. that, that, yeah, it's it a hot, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's a, it's a very hard place to be, to be eating an animal you respect, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's necessary. Uh, and for, I mean, there are a lot of vegetarians out in the world and uh, that's fine. You know, no, no, I actually was a vegetarian at one point and um, I learned that I, I needed the, you know, I kind of changed my thinking on that, but um it's hard for our society to just embrace this sometimes, I think, to know your food, basically. Yeah. 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 So I, I share this story as I was sitting at, in a restaurant. Um, I typically say it was Chick-fil-A because, you know, <laughs> it was. And I'm sitting there eating this chicken wrap and I th think to myself, you know, where did this chicken come from? Mm -hmm. What housing was this chicken in? How was this chicken cared for? What did this chicken eat? How far did this chicken travel to get to the restaurant mm -hmm. for me to eat it? How was it processed and handled? And I was thinking, I know none of these answers. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really got to thinking and coming around to the idea that, you know what, like it, it's really an utmost respect thing to the animal to know its care, to know mm -hmm. how it was taken care of, to know its life and its housing and how far it had to travel to be processed. And I don't know if you've ever been on the interstate and saw a, a semi truck load mm -hmm. full of chicken, but I just yeah. look at that and think, Oh, you know, it's like I know that's a part of the way things are to feed the masses in our culture. You mm -hmm. know, I know that that's a, there's some of that that can't be erased and I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it has to be, but for me and my family, I can make small changes to make that imprint smaller um, or, or condense it or reduce it just a little bit. Right, so yeah. I, I share with people to think about, you know, where is the food that you're eating coming from and, and how was it treated? Mm -hmm. I choose to treat my food with the utmost respect versus mm -hmm. in this, I don't know how it was treated situation. Mm -hmm. So it it really is a beautiful process when you step back and you look at it and you can give appreciation to that animal's life before mm -hmm. you sacrifice it. And, you know, I, I want to encourage people to, to think about that, to think about how you can show it respect and mm -hmm. appreciation. And, you know, I, I get a lot of flack from vegans for teaching people how to raise their own meat. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what speaks to me the most is when the vegan says, you know what, I really appreciate that you care about the animals. I may choose not to eat them, but I appreciate that you care and that you're mm -hmm. doing the best you can. And so I think that's the agreement that I would like, I would love for people to come to. Right. And, me too. You know, yeah. like, we, we can, we can eat differently, but as mm -hmm. long as we realize um, that meat eaters 
that are doing it themselves are doing it because they care so deeply about the animal. Right. They don't want to no, they don't want them to go through some of the processes that they are going through. So exactly, exactly. That is the, you know, I, I always wanted to be a, vet, a veterinarian when I was young and because I wanted to save animals lives and things. But when I became a homesteader, it really, it really helped me understand that my love, like you're saying for them is why I want them to come to be through me you know I want their end of their life to be through you know the care I have for them and and not have them suffer long and that sort of thing so yeah, yeah I love that okay so um what type like give us some some real tactical <laughs> some real <laughs> steps like what type of housing options are there for rabbits and and you also use yours for garden. You said you collect the poop. That's for gardening, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have our main breeders in our barn. Really, you just need something that has three sides for wind protection and um, a covering for rain protection. And if you are in a colder climate, you can always add a tarp or a forced side in the winter months if you need to. A lot of people start out with what we call a breeding trio, and that is two does and a buck. Mm -hmm. And that will get your family a decent amount of meat in a year. Um, you can choose to have your babies grow out in the cages with the moms. Or you can choose to separate them so that you can rebreed mom um, sooner and have more babies. Mm -hmm. So how we do it is we do separate the babies at six weeks of age. And if they are not sold to another family or, um, you, you know, basically if they're not sold to a family for a pet or for breeding stock, then they go out in what we have, uh, we call rabbit tractors. And they mm -hmm. are little mobile houses. We use the Salatin style tractor for these. Mm -hmm and they get moved on pasture every day. So essentially they are taking our grass and turning it into protein for our family. This is grass that we would normally mow. Um, and we try not to go over the same spot in the yard within six months to give any pathogens in the soil to um, die down and to reduce any disease pressure that they may face from being on the same ground close together. So. Okay. Depending on your space and what you have, you could, like I said, just grow them out all in cages or you could put them on your yard to help um, be able to grow more out at a time and to utilize the grass in your yard. Okay. So do I, I, I'm sure I've seen it on your Instagram about these rabbit, uh, these mobile cages, but uh, do they have bottoms? <laughs> Yeah. So okay. Yeah, you also ask about the poop, which I forgot to mention. Oh, right. Uh -huh. um, when they're in the cages, you can collect all the poop. Mm -hmm. When they're in these tractors, they do not have a solid bottom. They have wooden slats. Uh, I think ours are currently like an inch and three quarters uh, separated, and that those are down there because rabbits will dig out. A lot of people mm -hmm. say, why are the wooden slats there? And it's because if you don't have them there, they will dig out. And if you do mm -hmm. something like a chicken wire or a wire bottom, it will smash the grass down and the grass can't mm -hmm. come up through. But okay. with the wooden slats, grass can come up uh, between those slats and allow the rabbits to eat the grass. So okay. we do lose the manure per se, to our yard mm -hmm. by having the rabbits out on pasture. But I will tell you, we have the greenest backyard <laughs> in the county <laughs> for wow. these rabbits. And it yeah. was amazing to see this spring because like, we couldn't stay on top of mowing it. It was so wow. lush and full from these rabbits being out there on pasture. So. Wow. And so uh, uh, rabbit manure um, is one that you can put straight on in your garden. Is that correct? Yes, rabbit manure mm -hmm. is a cold compost, meaning it can be used directly on your plants. The same day it comes out of the rabbit's behinding, it can go on your plants. <laughs> Unlike awesome. chicken or cow that has to wait up to six months before it can be used. Mm -hmm. it's a very valuable fertilizer. It is two parts nitrogen, one part phosphorus, and one part potassium. Okay, NPK. that's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. that's actually my motivation really for wanting to get rabbits. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just having a backup in case we do need food, we'll have, you know, 
a male and a female, and then we can just put them together <laughs> if we need a food source. It's just sort of like a, pre a preparedness thing. Yeah. Like uh, right now, I mean, I know we could do it if we needed to, even despite the the cuteness factor. Like I've done things, I've had to do things over the years um, uh, for, you know, to, had to get past my issues to do the things. So I know we can. Um, but like right now, I don't particularly want to raise them for um, meat. But if I were to get into rabbits for that purpose, like a backup reason, is there a specific breed <laughs> um, sure. that would be best for that? Yeah. So there are several different ones you can use. I want to say before I even list the breeds is that if you have a garden, you need a rabbit. Okay, okay. <laughs> I want to encourage people, mm -hmm. even if you just have one rabbit out near your garden and you pet it every day and give it a few of your vegetables along with mm -hmm. their pellets and water, you are going to get your money's worth out okay. of that rabbit in fertilizer for your garden. It is a mm -hmm. uh, game changer for your garden. Uh, I've had lots of people buy bunny berries from me is what I call them mm -hmm. and tell me what a difference it's made for their garden. And they're back again the next year wanting more. So it mm -hmm. is invaluable for your garden. If you have the time and the space, get you a rabbit. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the next question was, sorry, what was the next question? Uh, what breed? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. What breed? So we typically, it's easy to find New Zealand rabbits or Californians. So those are your typical mainstream uh, meat breeds in America. Mm -hmm. There are more though. Any rabbit can be a meat rabbit. It just depends on how much meat you want, how fast of a grow out you want. We have New Zealand's and we have a polyface line. We also have some Harlequins, all mm -hmm. of which are pretty decent sized rabbits that can be used for meat production. Um, sometimes people will bring in a one of the giant breeds like a, um, a French Lop or what's the huge one? I'm drawing a blank. Um, I can't um, remember. I actually used to, uh, I actually used to farm sit for somebody who was raising uh, rabbits and she had those Angoras. Those big, uh, is it Angora? No, Angora, Angora are the ones with the long fur anyways. That's okay. Well, it was, yeah. <laughs> I did the same thing yesterday when I was on a podcast. I couldn't remember chicken breeds. I was like, uh, you know, the ones, the ones. <laughs> well, sometimes we'll take people will take the giant breeds and cross them with more of a medium okay. standard type of breeds. Um, American chinchilla is another huge one that people use. Uh, I have sit here and beside me, I have um, a book to recommend, and this okay. is Raising Rabbits for Meat by Eric. Rap and Colleen Rap. They have the largest rabbitry in America. Wow. And the reason why they have the largest rabbitry in America is because they work to preserve historic breeds. Um, mm -hmm. And that is what you see here are a couple of their, the breeds that they work to preserve. Okay. And oftentimes most rabbit breeders have what we call meat mutts. So they're not necessarily pedigree or a hundred percent of a breed in particular, but people that do conservation, obviously they have a hundred percent and they also get a very high uh, grow out rate, meaning they have a lot of meat when they process because they have worked hard to preserve these breeds that were great for um, meat production. I'm trying to remember exactly what breeds it is that they use here. Um, I want to say that's the, the American chinchilla and, um, now I should have prepared that. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, I, I, th the one, the big giant, oh, sorry, a good book. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll leave, we'll, um, include that name in the show notes as well so that people can check that out. Um, the big breed that you're talking about, whatever the name is, yes. I think my friend crossbred it with an, with a with a, um, the Angora because it was a big oh, fluffy one. Okay. So how fun and, is that? Yeah. <laughs> it was really cute. Yeah. Yeah. That is funny. So that, I guess I could circle into the five F's of rabbits. And okay, the first yeah. one I mentioned is food. The second one is fertilizer, which we have hit on. Um, the third one is fur. And that would be where you're actually harvesting the animal to use the fur to do things like line a coat, make a pillow, Mm -hmm. uh, the animal's life has to be sacrificed. And then there's fiber, 
which in the case of an Angora, the animal's life isn't sacrificed. They shear or trim off that hair to use it. And then uh, number five is a friend, which is most commonly why people have rabbits in America today. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Five, five, five what F's it, of rabbits. Yeah. Five F's of rabbits. That's cool. Hey there, homestead dreamer. Whether you're just starting out or have already dipped your toes into the homesteading world, I've got something special for you. It's all about setting up a solid foundation for your homestead plan and income strategy through thoughtful action and implementation. Because let's face it, starting a homestead is not too difficult, but keeping it sustainable can be a real challenge. Now, the decisions you make in those early years can truly make or break your experience. You either end up feeling confident and content, or you find yourself caught up in a never-ending struggle, like on a hamster wheel. And we definitely want to avoid that. That's exactly why I've created an amazing resource for you, the Workshop for Beginner Homesteaders and Dreamers. With this tool, you'll have a rock-solid foundation to build your homesteading dream upon. In the pre-recorded workshop, you'll dive into some valuable topics such as strategies for planning, savings, and generating an income, how to find and become a part of a supportive homesteading community, and developing the right mindset for homesteading success. And here's the cherry on top. Throughout the month of June, I'm offering my workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers at a special discount price. It's an hour and 40 minute video where I personally guide you through most of the Homesteading for Beginners workbook, which is included in the workshop price, by the way. To grab this offer, head over to healthyhomesteading.com forward slash workshop and use the code podcast at checkout. With this code, you'll get over 20% off the already low regular price. But remember, this discount is only available during the month of June, so make sure you take action soon. You can find all necessary links in the show notes of this podcast episode as well. I'm eager for you to get started. Let's make your homesteading dreams come true together.